Thanks be to God. Thanks for AC as well. Man, that guy <laughs> pumping me up. I'm ready to preach. <laughs> AC, love you, man. Thank you. Hey, my name is John. I'm one of your pastors here, and it is great to be with you guys. I love seeing you guys, love worshiping with you guys, and absolutely love getting to open God's word together. That's what we're doing. Continuing in the book of Revelation this morning. Well, last week, Warren and I got a cool opportunity. We got the opportunity to go over to GCU and hang out with some of the students that have started coming to our church, and it was a blast. We had a lot of fun getting to meet a lot of really great people, having conversations with with folks, and we got into a conversation with uh, a couple seniors who were getting ready to graduate from the School of Theology. And they thought it would be a good idea to try to debate Warren about some theological topics. And Warren's like, let's go, I've been waiting for this. No, I'm kidding, he didn't do that. And that's not what they did. We, we got into a conversation with them, students that are ready to graduate from the School of Theology. And I said, hey, what's next? What, what are you hoping to do after you graduate from GCU with your degree? And they said, and we really want to do missions. I was like, oh, that's awesome. And they proceeded to share a a few places overseas that God had put on their heart. And I said, man, that that is so encouraging to hear. And they said, but we're, we're just waiting. We're waiting for God to open the doors for us. Waiting for open doors. I started thinking about how many times people have asked me to pray for God to open doors for them in their lives. Started thinking about how many times I have prayed, God, would you open the door for me in this area? Would you open doors in my life? Waiting for open doors. But what does that even mean? You hear it a bunch, we pray for it. What does that mean? It means a clear opportunity. A clear opportunity from God. And as we come to Revelation chapter three this morning, Jesus tells this church in Philadelphia that he has opened the door for them. But what is this clear opportunity that he's given them, and how does that shape our lives today? That's what we're going to see as we read this letter to the church in Philadelphia together this morning. But before we do that, would you pray with me? Jesus, we're gathered this morning as your church in Tempe, and Lord, we are gathered to worship you, but we are gathered because we want to hear you speak. And so, Lord, would you speak to us this morning by the power of your spirit, amen. So go to Revelation three, we're picking up in verse seven, that you heard AC, so amazingly read. You can get out your apps, get out your Bibles and turn there. I'm gonna start reading. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write this, Philadelphia. This letter is to Philadelphia, but we need to understand the city of Philadelphia and what's going on in Philadelphia if we're going to understand why Jesus has given this church an open door. See, in previous weeks, you heard Warren tell you that Pergamum is like Las Vegas. And you heard Jake say that Thyatira is like Silicon Valley. And last week you heard Jim say that Sardis is like the suburbs. And I'm here this morning to tell you that the church in Philadelphia is kind of like Philadelphia. (laughs) Uh, Someone told me this morning, uh, uh, they were saying, yeah, what's the city listed uh, in the Bible from America? It's Philadelphia. I was like, oh yeah, that's true. It is. Um, Philadelphia. And you know what? This church needed a message of encouragement. And this is the most encouraging letter to all seven of the churches. And Jesus knew that the church in Philadelphia needed some encouragement after the Phillies got taken out. (laughs) And you know what? 
Jesus also knew that the church in Phoenix needed to hear the same encouraging letter because our team got taken out too. <laughs> but in reality, Philadelphia, this ancient city, is not in Pennsylvania. This is located in modern day Turkey. It was a city founded by the king of, the king of Pergamum. And a lot of cities, it was common during this time, Cities were founded for military purposes, but not Philadelphia. Philadelphia didn't serve a military purpose, but it had another very specific and special purpose. Philadelphia was founded to be a missionary city of Greek culture and language to the surrounding region. Or you could say Philadelphia was founded to propagandize and influence all of the people in the city and the surrounding area. That's why it was founded. And so actually, to continue with Warren, Jake, and Jim, Philadelphia is very similar to Hollywood. Propagandize and influence the broader society. And the reason why this is, is that Philadelphia actually had a very key location geographically. There will be a map on the screen. So Philadelphia was located on the main highway that was a, I think there will be a map on the screen, maybe. There it is, there it is. Um, located on the main highway that was the imperial postal route from Rome to Troas. The highway is not on that map, but you can see where it's located and then the broader region around it. And this highway is really important to understand because it actually connected all of those major cities together this was the highway in which all of Caesar's armies were traveling. All merchants traveled on this highway as well. And what that meant was that people were constantly coming to the city of Philadelphia, and that created an opportunity to influence. Can't help but think about the similarities to Tempe. Major highways in the city located off the 10, the 101, the 202, and the 60. People constantly coming to the city, an influx of people, the largest university in the country, ASU, people coming from all over the country and internationally around the world to our city, college students. You've got companies moving to our city. Look at Tempe Town Lake and the expansion going on there. The tech corridor right off the 101. Refugees and retirees, people are flocking to our city. The king of Pergamum had an agenda for founding Philadelphia, but God had another agenda. And has it ever dawned on you or have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, God has an agenda and is working behind the scenes in the lives of people that he's bringing to our city? And so what does Jesus say to this church in this influential location? Continues and he says the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you." So the first thing we see in this passage is that Jesus has opened the door for you to participate in his mission. Comes out and he says, I have the key of David. Well, why does he say he's got the key of David? Why David? Well, it's because Jesus, he lets the church know he's the holy one and the true one. He is the Davidic king. He is the Messiah, the one true God, the Messiah. He is the king who has the key, which means he has all power and all authority to admit people into the kingdom. This is the new Jerusalem. And so he says, hey, I control who enters the kingdom. And this is important for this church as they receive this letter, because just like Smyrna, if you remembered, I, I preached a few weeks ago on the church in Smyrna, just like Smyrna, 
the church is being persecuted in Philadelphia. Just like Smyrna, it's because the Jewish community in the city is hostile towards Christians. Just like Smyrna, Jesus identifies this Jewish community the same way as he does in Smyrna, and he says that they are a synagogue of Satan. It's important that we understand this strong language. This is not an anti-Jewish remark. The description of this synagogue, a synagogue of Satan, is not true of all Jewish synagogues. I talked about this in the uh, sermon to Smyrna as well, because out of all of the churches in the seven cities, there are Jewish synagogues and Jewish communities in all seven of these cities. And what we see is that there's only Jewish hostility in two of the cities, two of the synagogues, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And the reason why Jesus uses such strong language is that the Jewish synagogue, this synagogue has actually turned against the church. And what they've done is they've aligned themselves with Satan by falsely accusing God's people. Satan is the accuser, they are falsely accusing. And so now they've aligned themselves with Satan and are being used by him. And what they're doing is they have excommunicated the Christians from the synagogue in Philadelphia. This was the place that housed them and this was the place that protected them. And so Jesus says, hey, I have the key of David. He's telling the church, I have the key. And even though you've been shunned, and even though you've been shut out of the synagogue, even though, you've been, even though you've been ostracized in society and you're an outsider, you are insiders in my kingdom. Jesus wants them to know that they have a place with him, but not just a place, he continues and he tells them they have an opportunity. In verse eight, he says, I have set before you an open door. The open door. What is this open door? What is the opportunity Jesus has given them? It's missionary opportunity. Missionary opportunity. This is the church with the greatest missionary opportunity. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, throughout the New Testament, the language open door is explicitly used for mission. It's explicitly used for the spread of the gospel. It'll be on the screen. Paul writes this in Colossians 4, verse 3. He says, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account which I am in prison. So Paul says this in Colossians 4, but it also appears very clearly this same language in Acts 14, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, and many others. And so Jesus is saying the open door is missionary opportunity, but here's the other thing. We just talked about the city. It makes a lot of sense when you understand the location and influence of the city and the reason why this city was founded. What Jesus is saying to the church in Philadelphia, I've opened the door for you to participate in my mission. But why do they have the open door from Jesus? Is it just because of their geographic location? No, there's something that Jesus says here in verse eight. He says, I know your works. They've been faithful. They've been faithful to Jesus and Jesus continues and he says, I know your works you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. They've kept God's word, meaning they've obeyed. They've lived faithfully with their lives, but they also have not denied the name of Jesus, which means they've verbally been talking about Jesus. They've been proclaiming Jesus to people. And so you see that they've been faithful with their words and their works. But many other churches that we've been hearing about in Revelation the reason why they don't have this open door is because they have compromised their witness. They have not represented Jesus well due to idols and idolatry, which you heard over the last couple of weeks, you heard Warren preach about, Jake preach about, Jim preached about as well. And, and, and here's the thing, we all know the effects of a compromised witness. We all know the effects when someone doesn't represent Jesus well, right? This is why we don't give out church bumper stickers, okay? Because we've all been driving on the freeway and someone gets up on your tail and they're tailing you and you're like, man, what's this, 
person's problem. And then they cut over next to you and then they pull up next to you and they give you a friendly middle finger, give you the bird and you're like, geez, what the heck? And then they speed up and they cut you off. And right as they cut you off, boom, come check out my church. You're like, they're like, hey, you know what? I hate you, but Jesus loves you. You should check out my church. And you're thinking, I am never going to go to your church. And hear me, we laugh. And the reason why we laugh is because literally it's happened to every one of us before. And now you know why we don't uh, have Redemption Tempe bumper stickers. We say, hey, put them on your water bottle. Don't put them on your car. Um, (laughs) But that's not what the church in Philadelphia has been doing. They've been faithful. But yet they're a very small church. Jesus says in verse eight that they have little power. This is the smallest church out of the seven churches Most scholars say that this church is in between somewhere from two dozen to three dozen people. So you've got, let's just go on the the large end, you've got about 36 Christians. This is just a big redemption community. And so it might seem unlikely that this church would have the greatest missional opportunity, but their size doesn't matter because they're backed by the power of Jesus and they are participating in what he wants to do and his agenda for the city and the surrounding region. And so if Jesus has opened the door for them, how should they participate? What should they do? Jesus says, keep living faithfully. Keep doing what you're doing. Be faithful where you are at in Philadelphia. The interesting thing is Jesus doesn't say, hey, I've opened the door for you. Now all of you need to leave Philadelphia and go live other places. That's not what he says. He's opened the door and they're to live faithfully with their words and their works to demonstrate the love of Jesus and to proclaim the good news about Jesus. Or we could just say, show and tell. Show people the love of Jesus Tell people about Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, if you do this, this is what's going to happen if you keep living faithfully. In verse nine, he says, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down, bow down before your feet. And they will learn that I have loved you. Jesus says, if you do this, Those who are most hostile, the Jewish community in this city are actually going to come and bow down at your feet. This is not an image of humiliation. This is an image of repentance. What Jesus is saying is those who are most hostile to the gospel, if you live faithfully, they are actually going to come and repent. They're going to come to know me and understand that I love you, the church. This is the power of participation. But what happened in Philadelphia? Did this actually happen? Jesus is saying it's gonna happen if they keep living faithfully, but what ends up happening in the city? Well, the church was faithful. They lived on mission and there was an explosion of Christianity in the region. History shows us that there's a massive spread of the gospel and this church of three dozen people grew and grew and grew. A church that didn't even have a building because they were kicked out of the synagogue didn't just end up having one building, but there were churches all over the city and all over the region. Philadelphia became a Greek Christian city, and it was for about 1,400 years, and hundreds of thousands of lives were transformed by the power of Jesus because these Christians in this city lived faithfully. They heard this letter, and they participated in God's mission by living faithfully in the place where God had them. Several years ago, I was in my early 20s and many of you know, uh, I used to cut hair and so I was working at this salon cutting hair and I wasn't a Christian at the time and not many of you know, uh, I know a few of you cut hair, but salons are pretty wild. It's a wild place. We've been talking about Pergamum and Thyatira being crazy. Working in a salon is like working in Pergamum and Thyatira. You hear sex, drugs and rock and roll when you cut hair in a salon, it's sex, drugs and techno music. That's what it's like. And I'm working at this salon and it's a pretty crazy atmosphere. But 
there's a coworker named Robert. And this dude was different. He was different in a, in a good way. He's probably the most talented hairdresser that I've ever met. And a lot of times hairdressers are really, are really prideful and cocky, but this, this dude was humble. It's like, man, he's so talented, but he's humble. And he wasn't hooking up with his clients. He wasn't hooking up with coworkers like my other coworkers were. He was kind, genuinely cared about people. He was generous. He helped people, generous with his time. And, and I'd seen him be generous with his money even. And I'm thinking, man, something is different about this guy. And I heard from some of the people we worked with that he went to church. I heard that he was a Christian. And I'm thinking, man, if, if this dude's a Christian, he, he's like the first Christian that I've ever liked. And maybe the first Christian that I could see myself being friends with, right? And so sure enough, he ends up mentioning to me in a conversation that, that he goes to church and that he's a Christian, that, that he follows Jesus. And I remember kind of scratching my head like, wow, man, like I grew up around Christians and, and this, he's just different. And it was in that conversation that I had with him that this journey began over a period of time, over a couple of years. Now that journey led to us becoming friends. That journey led to us having a lot of conversations over a, a few years about life and about faith and about, about Jesus. And, and you fast forward a few years and I'm in this place where I hit a, a, a low point in life. Everything that I had been living for, trying to, trying to earn success and make a name for myself and all these things, I get to this place and I feel empty, I feel depressed. And I have this like existential crisis in life of like, I don't even know what I wanna do anymore. I don't know that I wanna cut hair anymore. And yet it was my friend Robert in that season who walked alongside of me, had conversations with me. He would text me, hey man, I'm praying for you. And I remember a conversation that we had actually at a water machine out of all places, it's crazy. Jesus is the living water, so maybe there's something to it. We have this conversation at this water machine and I remember him empathizing with me of just kind of the pain that I was in and confusion and he's like, hey man, he's like, maybe you need Jesus in your life. And I was like, man, you know, I grew up around the church and I'm like, yeah, I've heard that before. But there was something about him saying it that was different because I saw something in him. And he's like, hey, dude, would you ever come to church with me? There's this church that I go to, it's down the road. He's like, I think you'd like it. They're really into to art and creativity. And he's like, I think you'd, you'd really enjoy it. Is that something you'd be interested in? And I was like, I don't know, I'll, I'll think about it. But I took him up on his offer. And it was that invitation to church. It was at that church where I heard the gospel preached. And that is the place where I encountered Jesus and surrendered my life to Jesus. And my life has never been the same. But here's the thing, I needed Jesus demonstrated by my friend because if he had just started telling me that I needed Jesus, it wouldn't have meant all that much because I'd heard it a bunch before in life. But I needed Jesus proclaimed by my friend because if he was just some nice dude who was different at the salon, then I wouldn't be a Christian. But I'm here today preaching God's word this morning in this place because Robert participated in Jesus's mission and God used his faithfulness in my life. And in the same way that God opened the door for the church in Philadelphia and for my friend Robert, that Jesus has opened the door for you, the church, Jesus has opened the door for you to participate in his mission. But here's the thing. How many people in this room are in full-time ministry? How many people in this room are in full-time ministry? If you're a follower of Jesus, all of you. 
you are all in full-time ministry. If you are a Christian, you are in full-time ministry because ministry happens in all of life. What that means is you don't need to work at a church or be an overseas missionary to be in full-time ministry. Hear me, those things are great and God uses those people. I am one of them, but God has called you to the place where you are at and you are a representative of Christ in your neighborhood, at school, at your kids' school, at work, with your friends, wherever you go and hang out, you are a representative of Christ. And you're a representative of Christ in your job where you spend the majority of your time. You are a representative of Christ, which means you are in full-time ministry, whether you're a banker or a barista whether you're a teacher or in tech, whether you're in sales or in social work, whether you work in the medical field or whether you are a stay-at-home mom, you are in full-time ministry. Jesus has opened the door for you to participate, but are you willing to walk in the door? Are you willing to walk in the door? Are you willing to participate in his mission by being a faithful representative of him where he has you? Because here's the thing, when you are faithful, God actually uses your faithfulness to open more doors for the gospel. Because how you live matters. How you live matters because you represent Christ to the people around you. This is why the church bumper sticker is so problematic if you're road raging people and cutting people off. It's not just really bad church marketing, you are not representing Christ well. But what if, what if you lived a life that forced people to ask the question, what's different about you? What's different about you? Because my friend lived this way. He showed the love of Jesus, which made me ask him questions. What's different about you, man? He demonstrated the love of Jesus. He talked about Jesus, how Jesus had impacted his life. And then he invited me to church. But what if he didn't realize that he was a representative of Jesus and he thought that only his pastors were in ministry. You are all in full-time ministry, which makes you ask, well, how can I participate then? Do the same thing that the church in Philadelphia did. You demonstrate and proclaim. It's demonstration and it's proclamation. You show people the love of Jesus. You tell people about Jesus. But as soon as we start talking about, talking about our faith, it's like, oh man, you start, to, you start to clam up. It's like, man, is he gonna say the E word? Is he gonna say evangelism? I'm not gonna say evangelism because I know it makes you feel that way. So I'm gonna say it another way. When you talk about sharing your faith, Someone thought that was really funny. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. Whoever that was, that was amazing. Um, see, when we talk about sharing your faith with people, it makes us feel weird. And maybe you've never done it. And maybe you don't know how to do it. Here's my encouragement. Start somewhere and grow. Start somewhere and grow. And so maybe you're like, man, I just, I, I have no idea where to even start. I can't answer every skeptic's question. And so it just really freaks me out. And so therefore I'm not gonna do it. Well, think about this. How do you share the TV series that you're watching and that you're super stoked on with other people? When you go to that restaurant and it has amazing food and a really great atmosphere, how do you share it with other people? Or if you're like Brandon Bellerson, and you've ever heard him talk about the AMC A-list, this dude's like an AMC evangelist. I swear, he's got half the church signed up for this thing and they're paying him under the table because he, uh, he gets you excited about it. But how, how? Here's how. You simply share what you've experienced in a very easy way that's natural. And so I'm gonna give you guys three things. It'll be on the screen. Here's three simple ways that you can share your faith in Jesus with other people. The first one is listen. 
Listen to the people that God has put in your life. Think about it this way. Listen for the open door. Listen to their stories, their hurts, their hopes, their fears, their questions. And then you just simply talk about how Jesus is good news for them. And maybe that's like, I I don't know if I can do that. Start somewhere and grow. Number two, share. You simply just share how your life is different with Jesus. How your life has been different since you encountered Jesus. And maybe if that's still, hey, I don't know if I can do that, start somewhere and grow. Number three, simply just let people know you're a Christian and invite them to church. There's a power to an invitation. It's literally how I heard the gospel. My friend invited me to church. And so those are three ways. Listen to people, share, invite, take those. And these are easy ways to be able to talk about your faith with other people. Because here's the thing, Jesus changing lives is really exciting. And getting to participate is really exciting. But honestly, it's way easier to get excited about mission and it is way harder to keep going and endure in mission. It's way harder to keep participating in mission. But why? What makes it so difficult? What gets in the way? We're exhausted. It's exhaustion. You're tired, you're busy, you're discouraged. And you're just exhausted. And so you, you, you wonder, man, is it even worth it to keep participating in God's mission? Maybe you're just in a busy season of life and I empathize with you with three kids. I don't have the, the same amount of free time that I used to to meet up and talk about Jesus with people. And so maybe you're just in a busy season of life and you feel tired. Or maybe, maybe you've tried. And you're like, man, I participated And I tried to share Jesus with my friends, but they rejected me. Or I've been praying for my family and I've been sharing Jesus with my family and no one in my family has started following Jesus yet. And so you just begin to wonder, man, do I just, do I wanna keep my faith to myself? Do I wanna keep trying to do this? And if that's where you're at, you're not alone because I'm sure that the church in Philadelphia felt exhausted too. 36 Christians who have been backed into the corner. Their friends have turned their back on them. They've been kicked out of the synagogue. They're ostracized in society all because their faith in Jesus, because they're trying to follow Jesus. And I know that there were times, I guarantee where they're like, man, do we just wanna like go a day and just keep Jesus to ourselves?" kind of don't want to don't want to get picked on today, right? But yet in verse 10, Jesus tells us that they endured. He says that they have patiently endured. How? What what did this church hear in this letter that enabled them to endure? What did they hear? They heard the promises of Jesus. Continue in verse 11. I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, Jesus says, so that no one may seize your crown. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. The last thing we see, here in this passage is that Jesus gives you the endurance to keep participating in his mission. Jesus makes these promises to the church. He says right here in verse 12, he says, I'm gonna make you a pillar and you will never go out of my temple. They can keep participating because they have a place of permanency that is secure with Jesus. Jesus is giving them certainty here. This is meaningful for this church, because in 17 AD, there was a massive earthquake that destroyed this city and also destroyed Sardis. 
And due to that, there were daily aftershocks in the city of Philadelphia. Those aftershocks meant that everyone had to flee the city and no one could live in the city. Everybody lived in the countryside, in tents and in huts. They didn't have a place of permanency. And Jesus comes and tells them that they will be pillars, that they have a place of permanency. But this also would have been meaningful because they had been kicked out of the synagogue. And yet Jesus says, you'll be pillars in my temple and you will never go out of it. The temple is the dwelling place of God, where God dwells, and it is the church. Individually in us and corporately together as the church, we are the temple of God because of Jesus and because the spirit of God dwells in us. But what Jesus is promising them is he's saying they have a permanent place with him in the new Jerusalem. So they have certainty, but they don't just have certainty. They also have identity because Jesus continues and he says, hey, I'm gonna give you a name. And he says three different names. He says, the name of my God, the name of the city of my God and my own new name. These three names all mean the same thing. They're getting at the same thing. Jesus is giving them identity. They belong to Jesus. They will be given a name by him representing the intimacy that they have with Christ. And so he's not just giving them certainty, but they belong to Jesus and they have an identity. And what these three names mean is that they have union with God and eternal fellowship. Jesus tells the church these promises because he wants them to know that it's worth participating and continuing. There's an image on the screen. Jesus says, this is why it's worth participating. This picture is modern day Al-Shahir. That is the city that has been built on top of the ancient city of Philadelphia. This is the modern location of this city. Philadelphia though is in ruins. It is crumbled and it has been buried under Al-Shahir. But there is one thing from ancient Philadelphia that still remains today. And you can see them in this photo, the pillars. But these aren't just any pillars. The only thing that remains from the church in Philadelphia are the pillars of the church of St. John. What Jesus is saying is when everything crumbles and nothing is left, This is what remains. You have a place with me. And it is that promise that enables you to endure. But what about for you? Living in Tempe, how do you keep participating in Jesus's mission? How do you keep doing it? How do you continue on when you're exhausted? You remember what you have in Jesus. You remember what you have in Jesus because it's easy to forget. When you're exhausted, when you're busy, when you're distracted, when you're discouraged, it's easy to forget. But when you remember what you have in Jesus, you are just reminded of how good life with him actually is and you don't just want it for yourself, but you want it for other people too. Because when you look around, the people that you know and the people that you love and the people that you care about and you see them hurting, when you see them lost, when you see them struggling, you desperately want them to experience the transformative power of Jesus and the freedom that he brings and the healing that he brings and the joy that he brings, and the purpose that he brings, and the hope that he brings, and the renewal that he brings, and the peace that he brings. Church, Jesus gives you the endurance to keep participating because he is still at work in the world. He is still on the move. He's still opening doors. And the way that he worked in your life, he is still continuing to work in the lives of other people around you. He is making more pillars and he is giving out more names in his kingdom. And the two things that Jesus promises to this church the pillar and the name. 
He's promising certainty and he's promising identity. Certainty and identity. These are the two things that every single person is searching for in life, that everyone is grasping for in life, that everyone is trying to find, and they're found in Jesus. They're found in Jesus, and you have it. In a world of uncertainty where things crumble and where things collapse, Jesus is the one who gives you certainty because you have been reconciled to God. And that means that you are accepted and loved by him and you will never be shunned and you will never be rejected, but you have now become the temple, the place where God dwells. And in a world striving to create an identity, Jesus is the one who gives you your identity because through him, you have been adopted into the family of God and now you are his beloved. You are a child of God. This is an identity that you could never earn, but you freely receive it because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. These promises of Jesus to the church are good news to you and they're good news for everyone, which is why we participate in his mission. And it's why Jesus says, for those who have ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the church. Let's pray. And as you close your eyes, I'm gonna encourage you to do something a little different this morning as we talk about opportunity, as we talk about open doors. I wanna encourage you to pray right now and ask Jesus to bring someone to mind, a person or a place. And as you do that, to pray that Jesus would give you an opportunity this week to show the love of Jesus and tell them about Jesus. And so Jesus, we know that you're on the move, but we know that you are a missionary God who is on a mission, Lord, who is seeking and saving the lost. And so Jesus, I pray even right now that you would bring people and places to mind to every one of us in this room, Lord, that you would open doors this week for us that we could participate. Jesus, thank you for the work that you've done in our lives, Lord, that we would remember it even here and now this morning of how good you've been to us, of your grace that has saved us, of your power that has been at work in our lives, Lord, for the gift of your spirit, Lord, for the gift of the church, Jesus, that this morning, Lord, as we worship you, Jesus, that, that we would be propelled as we get sent out of these doors of this sanctuary, Lord, that, that you would empower us with your spirit to participate in your mission. So Jesus, thank you that, that you enable us, that you trust us, Lord, to, to be at work in your kingdom. And Lord, thanks for the gift of your spirit. And so Jesus, I pray that you'd be speaking to us now. It's in your name we pray, amen. Move into our time of response now. And we respond here in four different ways. We respond in singing. And so in a moment, I'm gonna have you stand and we're gonna, we're gonna sing to God because he's worthy of our praise. We also respond by giving in response to the generosity that God has given us in Christ, that he's given us everything that we have and everything that we need. We respond out of generosity as a way of participating in his mission. We respond by praying. And so there's men and women on, on both sides of the stage who would love to pray with you, pray for you. If you have anything going on in your life, 
come and pray with us. If you wanna bring a name or a place that, that you feel like God brought to mind right now, have us come and pray. We'd love to intercede and pray for people and places this morning. And lastly, we respond by taking communion. And we do this every week because we believe that the gospel is good news. And we believe that Jesus is present here in our midst. And so as we take communion this morning, the bread represents Christ's body that was freely given for us. And the wine or the juice represents Christ's blood that was shed for us. And so if you would please stand at this time and respond to the good news we've heard.